So good evening or late afternoon and welcome to Arizona and the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law here at Arizona State University. My name, My name is Grant Frazier and I was fortunate to serve as president last year of the Arizona State University uh, Federal Society student chapter and then this year for the, for the past 10 months I've been leading uh, the, the planning as symposium chair. Um, I want to welcome you all here today. Sorry, I'll try to avoid that. Uh, welcome you all here today, and for those of you from the East Coast, I hope that you're enjoying our good weather, and I think it's supposed to get even better throughout the weekend and be in the low 80s by Monday. Um, this is the first time that ASU Law has hosted this student symposium. I hope it will not be the last. I've had a, an amazing time planning this and going to have even more fun this weekend, and I know my fellow chapter members uh, feel the same. Now, this would not have been possible without the help of so many people, and I don't have enough time to list them, and I know you didn't come here to hear me talk. Um, so I, I need to just name a select few that were, were instrumental in bringing this here. So first and foremost, thank you, Dean Sylvester, Dean Chaudro, the ACU Law Administration and staff. There are three students uh, who I want to thank, and actually two of them are now alumni. They're all here tonight, Madalena Savory, Stacy Skanky, and John Thorpe. Uh, Madalena and John are, again, now alumni, but they came back tonight, and all three of those individuals will speak throughout the weekend, so you'll have an opportunity to meet them. Without their help, the initial proposal would not have happened, and none of the planning would have occurred either. So I'm, I'm indebted to them. Um, thank you to our sponsors, without whom this symposium wouldn't be possible. And a sincere thank you to Gene Meyer, Mr. Peter Redpath, and the rest of the Federal Society based in DC who has put up with way too many emails from me. Uh, thank you for being patient. <laughs> and also thank you to all of you uh, from the student chapters and also the, the attorneys and judges that we have here in attendance today. Thank you. Um, from the people from the East Coast especially for flying out. I know it was not an easy thing to do. And lastly, uh, and most importantly, a huge thank you to our current executive board and the symposium committee for putting in countless number of hours over the past 10 months. Now this year's symposium theme, the resurgence of economic liberty, highlights some of the key areas where legal thinkers and jurists tend to disagree, and not just in surface level policy ways, but in terms of first principles. Questions like the proper amount of judicial deference to political branches, how important economic life is to the fundamental rights that the framers talked about, and how much our constitution ought to protect rights on an individual as opposed to a structural basis. As well as the struggle over how government should respond to rapidly changing economic con conditions that have arguably been number one the number one driver of change in our legal institutions over the past century. It is a topic that is especially important to us here in Arizona as we pride ourselves on being leaders of economic liberty and deregulation, and it's important uh, as well at the state constitutional level for us. Now, but before we start formally, there are a few logistical things. So I know a lot of you are probably wondering about Wi-Fi, so I'll walk through that quickly. Um, there's a Wi-Fi network called ASU Guest. Once you select that network, you'll see a guest portal sign-in page. You fill out the information, create an account, you select the text me option and it will send you the account information and that will be good for 24 hours. Uh, we are expecting about another 200 people tomorrow, so this should be full. And when it is, an overflow room is in 140 right there and 240 there and the event will be live streamed into those rooms um, if you're not able to get a seat in here. And then refreshments up in that area so there will be water throughout the weekend when there are breaks uh, in the panels. Lastly, if you have any questions that I did not just answer or you forget the answers to, please reference the brochure, the mobile guide, or the independent uh, student symposium website, or look for one of the volunteers with the purple um, ribbon underneath their name tag. And with that, I will pass it over to the dean of our law school, uh, Douglas Sylvester. Dean Sylvester. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law here at Arizona State. I am not Richard Epstein, obviously. I am Doug Sylvester, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, Grant, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your incredible work in making this happen and for pandering the audience and getting a great applause and bringing this weather in. It's, it's really the right way to throw any event. <laughs> 
Um, I, I am extraordinarily proud to have this event here. I'm told this is the largest conference this law school has ever held. Uh, we are expecting a very large crowd here today and tomorrow. I want to reiterate Grant's point, which is, you're in Arizona, if you're not from here, drink water. Uh, just drink as much water as you humanly can. Uh, we don't want anybody dying, if that's at all possible. <laughs> that is really one of our sub-mottos when people visit here. Please don't die, it ruins the press. In addition to being one of the biggest conferences we've ever held, it really is something that I'm proud to have here. Uh, you know, we are looking for these kinds of events to raise the profile of this law school, raise the opportunities for people to see this ma amazing facility. For those of you who have not been here before, this is our third year here in the Buse Center for Law and Society. As you can't, if you can't tell, it was really built to hold conferences. That's what we do. Not in July, but really this time of year. So as you come here, we really hope you're going to return year after year after year. Uh, and so it does take, obviously, a lot of people to make these kinds of events happen. To my staff, I want to point out, I want a head like this. I think my profile <laughs> would work beautifully. It's uh, every dean should have one of these. I think it's quite wonderful. I know that uh, it really does take leaders of the Federal Society Student Organization to make this happen. Grant, you've been amazing in making this happen. I know I saw John Thorpe out there earlier. I know John was crucial in starting this, Madalena Savory, Savory, and then of course, Stacey Shanky as well. So it really does take uh, leaders to make these kinds of events happen. And so thank you again to making it uh, possible for you to be here tonight. So as always, even less than Grant, no one's here to hear me talk. I know you're here to listen to Richard and Judge Thapur and others to talk about wonderful topics that are going to occur here. So my next job is really just to run interference between all of you and Richard before he gets up by introducing him. Uh, if ever there's been a, a faculty member who needs no introduction to a crowd, it really is Richard Epstein. So I'm not going to spend much time talking about his thousands of publications and all the areas in which he has influenced law and regulation. I can talk a little bit about my personal connection to Richard. It was almost 22 years ago to the day that Richard introduced me and interviewed me, I'm sorry, for a Bigelow Fellowship, uh, which surprisingly I got, despite failing that interview tremendously at every turn. At some point, we started talking about sheep in New Zealand. That's what I really remember. And it turns out I knew a lot about animal husbandry, and maybe that was the key to me getting that particular position. Uh, but ever since then, for those of you who don't know Richard personally, he's really one of the most generous spirits you'll ever know in your life, taking people under his wing and helping them at any point in their career. Richard was one of my recommenders when I went on the market for a job. I failed that year. I don't think he recommended me the next year, and maybe that was why it all worked out for me. I don't know, Richard, but uh, it really is something to know about the man that in addition to being really one of the great idea people in our industry, he's really just one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet. And so before I introduce him, I know we were just talking, Judge Thapur and Richard and I, that we've decided what we're going to do is Richard's going to keep his comments to about three hours. Then we're going to have a panel <laughs> that will go on late into the morning. And we promise we'll wrap up and get you back here for the morning panels so that you can really enjoy Saturday as well. So without any further obnoxious commentary, Richard Epstein, my hero, welcome to here. Thank you all. It's really a, a great pleasure to be here. I, I want the organizers to note that I am under a strict injunction not to engage in the infelicitous practice known as uh, temporal trespass. But in order to make sure that we get our sums correctly, the time is 5.15, the session is 30 minutes, we're already late. I will try not to make us any later. Um, I'd also like to thank Doug for uh, welcoming me here. He was a most diligent Diglo fellow, and we've kept up ever since then, and I've watched him make the uh, Sandra Day O'Connor School even greater than it's ever been. I also want to thank Grant, because the uh, best testimony to his administrative skills was to get me here on time. Uh, I've been known to mess up on uh, various sorts of things. I also want to thank him particularly because as I looked down at my little um, smartphone, I found out the title of my lecture, which I had not known previous to that time. Uh, and I, I, fortunately, I was going to talk about the subject generally anyhow. But for those of you who care to figure out what the official title is, uh, the title is, is uh, Lockman versus New York constitutionally defensible. I do not regard that as an accurate title. I think the better title is why Lockman against New York is constitutionally required. And, and I hope to explain why it is that the more exuberant version of the proposition 
is entitled to the respect um, that I hope to give it. This has been a campaign on which I have been engaged pretty much from the time that I first dealt with the issue in law school. And in order to explain why it is I'm going to do this, I'm going to do two things at the very least. One, I'm going to try to sort of give the general theory of economic liberties and explain why that theory is one which is entitled to constitutional respect as a judicial as opposed to merely a legislative matter. And then I'm going to spend more time uh, talking about the so-called anti-canon, a phrase invented by Columbia law professor Jamil Green, who says there are four cases in the world um, that deserve universal condemnation, Dred Scott, Plessy v. Ferguson, Korematsu against the United States, and uh, Lochner against New York. And, and I would like to explain why it is that Lochner is a very much the odd man out in that particular quartet. In so doing, I will take issue not only with the consensus of American opinion, but also with the Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court, who in Obergefell, for example, said what I regard as one of the most outrageous statements ever made, uh, which is that he puts uh, Dred Scott and Lochner in New York in the same boat. Uh, for the record, I would have dissented in Dred Scott, if any of you would like to know my opinion on it, and I think that there's a perfectly good reason why those two positions are much more consistent than the false parity between the two of them. Well, on the basic question about theoretical issues for the Constitution, there are two kinds of questions that one always has to answer. One is, are there any permanent and eternal truths? And the second one is, if there are not, um, what are the kinds of things which are likely to change from time to time? If you can make the first case credible, so that permanence is an intellectual feature or defensible, then in effect making a position like that constitutionally protected is extremely important because if the theory has a certain degree of universality, why would you want to subject it to political risk? But if it turns out you're trying to make ad hoc adjustments in formalities, statutes of limitations, joinder of party rules, and so forth, why would you want to put yourself into a straitjacket when it turns out that the necessities of procedure may change, for example, with technology? Well, I regard the following proposition as one of the kind of eternal truths, which is no matter how hard you try, you cannot figure out any particular way in which you can outperform a well-functioning uh, competitive market. And the explanation for that, I think, is frighteningly clear. Uh, what you're trying to do with respect to the world is not to create a, shall we say, a bastion for individual egotism. And in fact, one of the great disservices intellectually has been the notion that somehow or other anybody who's in favor of markets is in favor of possessive individualism, which makes it clear that this is a theory which is designed to reward selfishness rather than to advance some degree of social welfare. I don't believe it's that. Essentially what happens is, no matter how hard you look, if you can get a competitive equilibrium, it's a Pareto optimal position, uh, which means that there's no way you can make anybody better off unless you start to make somebody worse off. It's also the case if you're not at that particular optimal point, uh, you can have a Pareto improvement, uh, which will get you there and spread the goods around amongst every other person. Now, why does it turn out that this is the case? Well, the first thing to note is that a competitive market will exhaust to the extent that you could keep transactions cost low, all the gains from trade, and these gains will be shared by all the parties who are involved in the particular transaction. Uh, there is always the question of whether or not there are any externalities associated with these kinds of gains from trade, and the answer is they are, but in ordinary markets, they tend to be positive, not negative. If it turns out that I and the worthy judge enter into an exchange, he's happy by virtue of it, I'm happy by virtue of it, whether we're talking about happiness or wealth is a detail for these purposes, and that sets each of us up to be a larger and more inviting target for other people and other voluntary exchanges. So through the series of voluntary exchanges, what you can do is get ripple effects so that the third party effects will be positive. Uh, the older fellows who were writing about this in 1900 and 1905 were not particularly cognizant of the formal theory, but intuitively they understood exactly what this theory was like because there was not a single reference at any particular point in time in our constitutional history where somebody said that contracts in restraint of trade, i.e. the antitrust type situation, was simply beyond regulation. And it's also equally clear in this period that rate regulation with respect to natural or legal monopolies was regarded as a perfectly correct kind of an approach. How you do it is much more technical. But the whole point is 
these guys were in a position where if you didn't have a competitive market, you could think of some form of regulation that was helped. But the converse is where you can find a competitive market, uh, you would not do it. That intellectually turns out to be the correct position. The details on how you run regulation are extremely difficult for both antitrust laws on the one hand and for rate regulation on the other, but you can't improve on perfection. And so when it starts to deal with the question about competitive markets and intervention, you have a very strong and permanent constitutional position. So that's why I think it's uh, essentially constitutionally required, just the way the protection of freedom of speech and religious freedom are required, because if you go through the same exercise and so forth, uh, the information between the parties is good and then the externalities tend to be positive until you get to fraud and defamation, which are of course the analogies to restraints and trade. So when you start looking at the four cases that are put together, how do they stand up against this particular situation? Well, the first of them is the Dred Scott, which is known for its nobility of character in the way in which it praises all individuals. This was a decision which said, in effect, that uh, slaves of African descent were not fit to be human beings, and that when George, um, when Thomas Jefferson drafted the Declaration of, of Independence, right, talked about how all men were created equal, there was a little asterisk that uh, Justice Roger Tawney put in the footnote, unless you were black and of African descent. And not only did he say that, but he said this is such a powerful little asterisk uh, that no state is entitled to reverse that particular presumption and to grant citizenship to any individual uh, so that you could get diversity jurisdiction um, in a federal court. And if you're a libertarian, as I am, uh, what you tend to think is that people have natural and inherent rights, and amongst those rights that they have are the ability to enter into voluntary transactions for their own being, and slavery um, is the negation of that, as is the denial of any form of civil capacity that other people would start to have. Uh, so when somebody wants to condemn a Dred Scott, you don't only do it because of its technical stuff, you also do it because the general theory that animates economic liberties, which is the general theory that animates social welfare writ large, is a theory which undeniably condemns that particular view. Uh, so the first case certainly belongs in anybody halls of horror, and I think it probably deserves the number one ranking in the American history, and I think it will keep that for a good and long period of time. Now, we did overrule Dred Scott, technically speaking, although we did not get rid of all of its damages, uh, by the first clause of the 14th Amendment, which announced that any person who was born in the United States or naturalized here was a citizen in the state in which he resided and a citizen of the United States. Unfortunately, the promise of the 14th Amendment was successfully chopped to bits in the next 35 years after it was passed. The slaughterhouse cases were one illustration of a frighteningly narrow interpretation of what the protections of citizenship meant. And then we get to Plessy v. Ferguson, which is the second in the cases in the halls of horror. And it's important to understand that what this case was, came down around 1895 or 1896. This was exactly the same time that a case called Allegaire against uh, Louisiana announced that the right to enter into contract was a natural liberty uh, guaranteed to everybody by the 14th Amendment. And then at the same time, the question is, what's the antithesis? Well, the antithesis turns out to be the police power, the ability to regulate for the health, safety, morals, um, and general welfare of the public at large. And in Plessy v. Ferguson, what they said was that this police power is enormously capacious in the way in which it starts to operate, and that the separation of the races is essentially perfectly legitimate as a way to preserve peace and tranquility with respect to the realm. One of the truly dreadful things about uh, just, Justice Brown's decision on this, and he was a northerner, is he says all we're doing in Plessy v. Ferguson is preserving the rights for individual um, uh, freedom of association. Uh, it's a rather odd claim to make when the purpose of the statute is to force people to stay apart because essentially Plessy was a rigged lawsuit in which two people pretended to have a difference when both of them wanted to have the right to run their trains as they saw fit without having mandated segregation with respect to going on. I think it's fair to say that Plessy is not as bad a decision as was uh, a Dred Scott, but it's the saddest thing about it is that there was only one dissent at the time of the defender of the colorblind constitution, uh, which was John Marshall Harlan. He also dissented for very different reasons in Lochner, but he also wrote the opinion in the dare against the United States, rightly in my view, 
which said you cannot make it a criminal offense for an employer to refuse to hire a worker if he would rather not have that worker in his employ. So Carlin was not uh, somebody who was a modern New Dealer. He was a somewhat shaky classical liberal uh, with a broader conception of what's health uh, than anybody else. And then when you start to get to the third of the cases, I'm going to put Lochner off for last, Korematsu is a much more difficult case to deal, although I think the Chief Justice was right to overrule it. Why is the case so difficult? Well, you just have to look at the cast of fact characters who are lined up four square behind that particular decision. And you will wince a little bit when I read some of the names to you. Who argued the case for the government? It was none other than Herbert Wexler, who later became a distinguished professor at the Columbia Law School. Who was the attorney general in the state of California who implemented it? It was none other than Earl Warren, who was rumored to have become Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court in 1954. Who was the man who wrote the opinion? It was Hugo Black, a noted civil libertarian, who till the day he died said wrongly, in my view, uh, that he would not change a single word of that particular opinion. He thought it was exactly right the way it was done. And he managed to get the concurrence of, amongst others, Felix Frankfurter and Holland Fistone. Uh, so what's going on in this particular case is that these characters make a very important mistake, which is to overact whenever they see claims of necessity for national security and do not take a good hard look at it, just the way today certain Republicans don't want to take a good hard look at the Trumpian wall that was recently vetoed, or can we say that, uh, by the uh, Senate. And oh, if you just do the time situation, uh, the internment was organized in May of 1942. The decision didn't come out until the end of 1944 after the election. And the Battle of the Coral Sea was already been won by this. And the thought that the Japanese were going to invade on the West Coast was a dead letter. And yet we kept people in jail for two and a half more years. I regard this as a different kind of error uh, from the sort of the racial malevolence that's associated with Plessy on the one hand and with Dred Scott on the other. But it does show a real blindness that should remind us always to follow a John Milton's injunction that necessity is the tyrant's plea and that you have to be extremely careful about ways that cases that are doing that and restricted to cases of imminent peril of property damage or invasion, none of which were present in the situation as we had it now. So now, why does Lochte belong in this particular group along with these other cases? Uh, to recall what the statute said is there are certain classes of bakers, not all bakers, um, who essentially are not going to be allowed to work for more than 10 hours a day or for 60 hours a week. Um, and the question was whether or not this particular infringement could be justified on some kind of police power ground, most notably health, safety, and so forth. And if you start looking at this, the first question you're talking about here is, obviously, there's a case for economic liberty. Uh, you will remember that Lochner v. New York is not a case in which a disgruntled worker is suing an employer for having been misled or deceived in the operation. It's a criminal prosecution of the employer whose workers were four square on his side. Uh, David Bernstein wrote this wonderful little book on it, and it explained that the reason they put this statute in place was that it turned out that the non-union bakers worked very long days and literally slept on the job. And if you read section 9 of the statute, which had the 10-hour provision in section 10, what it says is sleeping quarters must have adequate ventilation, which they upheld without so much as a quarrel. And so this case had nothing to do with health, according to Peckham. And the man who managed to concur in Plessy v. Ferguson nine years before writes an extremely thoughtful opinion in which he says, we know that the police power matters, but we know that we can never read the police power in such a particular way uh, that what the police power does is essentially swallow everything before it so that the protection of individual liberties or of private property is always going to be overruled. Is this a serious issue? Well, if you look at modern takings jurisprudence in the United States Supreme Court and you watch the song and dance in the Penn Central case by Justice Brennan, you realize that rational basis review can have exactly that result in a very, very bad kind of way. And Peckham was right about this. So then why is it that Chief Justice Roberts starts to think that a case which is designed to protect individual liberty and freedom of contract is equivalent to one that deals with degradation of individuals? And the answer from him comes from a following sense. One is he says you have to be aware of institutional competences on the one hand, and you also have to be prepared not to allow judges to engage in the imposition of their judicial preferences in the way in which cases are decided. 
But somebody who believes in Lochner believes in exactly that. And so if you start looking closely at what's going on, you have to go back and look at the opinion that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote in this particular case in his famous dissent, which is one of the most elegant positions ever taken in pen and one of the most wrong-headed decisions ever issued on points of this particular sort. And so let's just start with the ominous beginning of that opinion, which says this case involves a theory which a large portion of the United States does not entertain. Well, that's a reason why if the Constitution is right, you have to resist those popular passions. I could write the following opinion when I overrule the First Amendment protection by saying uh, First Amendment protections are something which a large portion of this country does not respect today. I can sign you lots of polls which will indicate that is indeed a true statement. In fact, there may be an entire political party dedicated to the proposition uh, that <laughs> freedom of speech shall not be allowed to survive so long as this nation turns out to be a nation. Um, and so that's really not going to do it. And then what he says is uh, that the Constitution is one that simply is meant for people of fundamentally different opinions, right? And that we have to understand that. One of the things that Holmes says that the Chief Justice most tellingly does not include in there is Holmes was something of a political theorist, and he was influenced by the German philosophers of the time. And he says whether it be the theory of laissez-faire or of the organic relationship of the individuals to the state, which is a fancy American way of talking about German theories of the folk um, who sort of overwhelm the community and have a collectivism about it, which can be nice in some cases and can lead to rather dramatic results which took place only 30 years after uh, the result in Lochner came down. And if you leave out the phrase, then you can see why the Chief Justice is just dead wrong on this thing. If there's one thing you can say about the Constitution, it did reject the theory of the organic relationship between any individual and the state. Uh, to be sure, we have in the preamble, we the people, i.e. the collective. But every time we use the word people in the Fourth Amendment, for example, the right of the people to be secure in and so forth, the word people is meant to protect each individual from various forms of government objections and control. It is not designed to say that we could swap any individual system of rights because we live in the People's Republic of the United States, East Germany, or China. And so it's a very different kind of thing that you have. And then what happens is, well, we then start to figure out what the institutional arrangements are going to be in these kinds of cases and how we're supposed to uh, put them together. And how do we decide what is or is not a judge's preference? So here's the following test that you have to ask yourself. Is, do we really think the trouble arises because we strike down laws or because we preserve laws? Is it because we're an activist or we're not? Well, it turns out it's a completely divided situation. Um, Dred Scott struck down of the Missouri Compromise, uh, but essentially Plessy v. Ferguson upheld anti-miscegenation laws, segregation in public schools, and segregation on the public rails, so you can't figure out which way you're going. Korematsu upheld the internment, and Lochner stuck something down. So it can't be that's what's at stake. You have to have a moral compass when you look at these things to figure out what's going on. Now, how do you get that? Well, you ask the following kind of question. Uh, suppose it turns out uh, that we would put everything into the hands of the legislature. How would we start to think about it? And so suppose somebody says, you know, there's really nothing terribly wrong about Dred Scott that can't be fixed if a unanimous Congress decides to vote for it. I think most of us would regard that as some kind of a moral obscenity, uh, given the fact that the purpose of legislation is to protect individual rights, not to trample them down in a random fashion by the central government. And if it starts looking at Plessy, the fact that the legislature was willing to do this is all the more reason for somebody like John Marshall Holland in dissent to say, this is beyond the scope of the legislative function. People should be able to organize their own business in their own ways. And it was the case, in fact, that if there's any common law rule with respect to common carriers, it's a general non-discrimination guarantee of service because of their monopoly position. It's not a requirement of separation. So you get it wrong in every which way in that particular case. Korematsu, um, this probably may have been validated by the president or some other thing. Uh, that's not going to cure it if it turns out you don't meet the requirements of the situation i.e. on the necessity. So you then look at Lochner in New York, and suppose somebody said, Chief Justice Roberts, the Congress of the United States has decided, thank God, to repeal the Fair Labor Standards Act, which governs situations having to do with overtime and minimum wages. Is that going to be one of the great scandals of the time? 
No, you're going to be perfectly happy if it overrules that. Uh, the point is it's the substance that matters in that particular case. And the substance of the first three cases that I'm talking about cannot be justified uh, by a congressional authorization because we understand that uh, governments are created by individuals to preserve their rights through legislation, uh, but to the extent that legislatures may behave, uh, then it turns out we have to worry elsewhere. And so this is the last irony, I'll end on this note, well, what do we do with Obergefell where he wrote the dissent? And I regard this as a very difficult case. There is no question if you talk about the way in which Holmes described this, whether or not uh, laws that limited marriages to one man and to one woman were consistent with the history and traditions of our people. The answer is surely they were. And so there's a very powerful view, enunciated most powerfully by my friend Steve Calabresi, if I'm not mistaken, right? Um, which says essentially it's traditional, is he here? I don't even see him. Um, traditional liberties are what is protected. And so the great question that you have to ask in a case like Obergefell is you have a conception of liberty which would cover same-sex marriage and polygamy. Um, and the question is whether or not you want that conception to deal in conflict with the historical understanding which is the opposite way. That's a very, very hard case. But Lochner itself is a relatively easy one. I see, in effect, that I now have seven minutes and 42 seconds for questions, so I will take them from you. Thank you for listening. Somebody? I mean, I, I will run on at great length, and there's no question. <laughs> But I would assume that as a sign of the Federal Society that somebody would either want to take issue or even more preface it. The problem with your speech, Professor Epstein, is there are three other arguments in favor of Lochner that you missed, and here's what they are. Will somebody do something for me? Come on. Ah, oh, yes, brave soul. Up you go. I'll take a stab at this, but uh, Lochner. Loud voice. All right, I'll try. Lochner presents own case launched in Europe, so I think the concern for a lot of people with Lochner is that in launching the era, you had not a not a sense to define rights for people, but a sense to essentially rein in government power by the states. So in terms of there being that federal government, state government dynamic there, how do you address the fact that much put in judicial activism is in terms of through Lochner, how do you preserve state sovereignty under the time? Uh, now, there are two questions involved in this case. Uh, question number one is the substantive question, which says that Lochner is not a case, Lochner is an era. And it's the afterglow that comes in there that gets us troubled. And then there is the clear federalism issue which is involved because what Lochner against New York law did was to strike down at the federal level a decision that was made at the state level. So I think those are the two issues. Well, let's just start with the first of them, then we'll turn to the second of them. In the first of these questions, what you then have to do is to look at the decisions post Lochner and see whether or not it deviated from the model that I gave at the beginning of the talk. That is, what it did is it managed to intervene in those cases where competitive markets worked, or it didn't intervene where they didn't work. And if you start looking at the cases, uh, they're remarkably good. So just to give a couple, uh, the case about the New York Central Railroad against White, uh, 1916, upheld the workman's compensation statute. The opinion was written by Justice Mallon Pitney, uh, the greatest undepreciated judge in the history of the United States Supreme Court who also wrote a case called Coppage in Kansas, which said, as did Justice Hall in eight years, seven years before in 1915, uh, uh, that you cannot make it a crime for somebody to employ somebody whom he doesn't want to do, right? Uh, but these were workman's compensation laws. There was an obvious safety element with respect to them. Even though this was the subject to contract, he sort of followed the general view that the police power applied. About the same time, you had blue sky laws, which were designed to deal with the control of fraud in various kinds of markets, and they were uniformly upheld in exactly this kind of a period. If you wanted to talk about rules that were designed to deal with the runs against banks, they were also proposed in this particular period, and they were upheld. And so if you go through the cases in which they're upholding, and you take the earlier account of the police power seriously, most of them turn out to fall within it. 
One interesting case which is at the edge was Jacobson against Massachusetts because this seemed to be a case which said that you have to be vaccinated against your will in order to prevent the spread of various kinds of illnesses. Uh, what happened in that case was the fellow wasn't making the anti-vaxxer protests of today. He said, I had three or four vaccines and they damn near killed me. And the judges didn't force him to get a vaccine. If you read the opinion, the statute required him to pay a $5 fine which I think is a rather different kind of proposal. Not a bad one, because most people may not want to pay a $5 fine, uh, but this guy would surely do it. Uh, so the cases were there, and I've also mentioned the antitrust laws, right, on the one hand, and the rate regulation cases. So I don't see that there's anything about the era which is any more wrong about the cases. And I mean, if we had more time, we could go into more of the uh, kind of complications having to do with secondary boycotts, low v. Lowell, and all the rest of that. But most of these cases are pretty darn good. Now, the federalism question, you're surely right, is that it's uh, not New York State. And there were people, my friend Bob Ellison is one, maybe Ernst Freund was another, although it wasn't so clear, who wrote about the police power the year before, who said it's OK for state judges to strike down statutes which federal government ought to give a pass. But that's also inconsistent with the basic structure of the 14th Amendment, which major purpose is designed to put federal restrictions on the ability of states to do things. Early on, we had the famous proposal of the Madison Negative, which says you can't pass any state law unless you get Congress to agree. This was one of James Madison's, peace be with us, very dumb ideas, uh, which essentially was shot down at the particular time. But with the 14th Amendment says you propose, but if it turns out you interfere with the privileges and immunities, the due process, the equal protection, and so forth, well, we will now have a federal override. And why was this done? Well, for two reasons. One, in the economic sphere, it was understood that there was a lot of skullduggery taking place at the state level and that you couldn't get it only by doing cases like Dartmouth College, where there happened to be the convenient nature of a grant from the government, uh, which the state government wanted to renege on. You needed to have a more comprehensive protection of equal in economic liberties. That was denied in a case called Ogden and Sanders from about 1894 where the contracts clause was not given any prospective application. I think that the dissent, which was both Story and uh, uh, whatchamacallit Marshall, was correct. Uh, the purists seem to think otherwise, including the guys who told me I couldn't say that with the force I wanted to in the Heritage Dictionary on this particular point. But I think, in effect, that that's there, OK? Uh, so what you then do is they say, well, we're going to let you do whatever you want. And then we've got this filter. And they really meant it to be a filter. And why was it that the decision in Slaughterhouse was such a disastrous case in many ways? It's because what it did is it took Justice Miller's injunction uh, that we do not want the United States Supreme Court or the federal government, remember, through Section 5, to be a perpetual censor on what states did. If you go back and you read the history, that's exactly what they wanted them to do. Uh, not to sanction any other thing, but to have a perfectly coherent account of what's going on. If you don't have a classical liberal account of what interjections are good and bad, you can't get it right. And they went their level best to get it wrong. And what happens is, by the time we get done, economic liberties, which are bounced out of the privileges and immunities clause, jump back in and do process and equal protection where they probably don't belong, uh, mainly through the notion that without uh, due process is equal to without just compensation, and you're off to the races in the rate regulation cases. So this was a very hard question of constitutional correction. One bad decision gives rise to an effort to correct it. Do you want to do it? Do you not want to do it? These are very hard cases. But I don't think either of those charges are correct, because what the court did in Lockton was that, and nobody at the time had the slightest objection to the federal oversight with respect to what was going on. They just thought the decision was wrong. Why was that? Because they read too much Felix Frankfurter, who was tended to believe that every successful contract was a form of exploitation. And if you go back and you actually look at the history, the greatest improvement in the history of humankind, without exception anywhere on the face of the globe, was the economic progress in the United States between 1870 and 1940. Uh, that just happens to be the Lochner era. And so if you really want to attack the lock in the ear, uh, maybe you want to explain, well, why is it that life expectancy improves by 20 years over this time, uh, that all the major drugs, all the major improvements, the control of, of public stuff, there was never a lock in the judge who said you can't build a sewer out of public expenses. And in fact, that's why Justice Holmes was to talk about our Constitution as laissez-faire. 
because laissez-faire in its pure form does not allow the government to provide collective goods. But these guys were much more classical liberals to do this. If you want the history, intellectual history of laissez-faire, there's a great article by Jacob Viner in 1960 uh, which essentially says he thought it was right on everything if you understood it correctly, except perhaps on the question of redistribution. So I don't think either of those charges actually start to stand up if you study this period closely. And the great tragedy that we see today is close study is not there. Now, some mistake hath all too long a lease. Trespass at time is something that's appropriate. I gave an inordinately long answer to this question. I will sit down now and forever hold my peace. Thank you.